the most important aspect of PZ2 are its worlds. After all, its original name was PZ2, it's about time. They were a huge selling point, and one of the few things George Fan contributed to the sequel, from what I've heard. It helps create a theme for each area and enemy, and I think this adds a lot to the game. It's a big part of why the game is relevant today. You're not just fighting zombies. You're fighting zombie cowboys while maneuvering plants across lightning speed minecarts. Or fighting zombie knights in the middle of the dark ages. It's great, honestly. However, not all worlds can be made equal. But you see, that would be too simple. No, instead we as human beings must place these worlds in a natural order, such as the importance of, uh, human psychology? Or something. It's also, conveniently, a relatively easy script to write between you and me, and I am feeling particularly lazy today. So yeah, world tier list it is, though we should cover what we are looking for and ranking specifically. I'll be ranking each world based on my personal opinion, obviously, but that has been formed a lot through playing mods, just as much as playing vanilla. In general, I won't rank a world high because of mods solely, but if a world tends to stuff when experimented with, it will be lower than you may expect. Also, because of this, I am ranking worlds ignoring the levels. I played enough of these worlds to get a general feel of them, so this should make sense as we go on. Some worlds really benefit from this, mostly the early worlds where levels are reused in vanilla over and over. I'll be mostly considering the world gimmicks and zombies as a result. I will talk about the plants in the world, but I will note now that I don't think any world has been significantly affected by the plants in it. You can use them outside the world at the end of the day, and so where they unlocked rarely matters. I have also considered music and the like too. I'll be entirely honest, I usually play the game muted, but I have all the songs burned permanently into my brain, so it's probably fine. Oh, and the tutorial isn't a world, it literally has nothing. Let's get ourselves started. We'll be ranking these from the worst to best, to fill suspense, and so we theoretically end on a good note. So, with that said, let's get started with the worst world in the game, Frostbite Caves. Frostbite Caves does have its fans, but I am absolutely not one of them. And realistically, I have met like two people who have ever liked it. The world doesn't exactly have many redeeming qualities to compensate for escaping flaws. It's an interesting setting, at least, but not one without issue. Firstly, every zombie in this world is immune to freezing, instead being chilled for the duration. Sure, I guess, I don't have much to say on this mechanic. It does make coal plants less useful, but you won't be using them anyways, as a much bigger issue is on the horizon. Frostwinds! <laughs> I've covered Frostwinds extensively before. I do not like them. They force the player into using a small selection of plants with no real tactical value beyond that. It makes Frostbite Caves a world that has a bad habit of playing the same way the entire time, especially as a lot of the heaters simply aren't valuable in any real sense. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and overall, I think the world suffers immensely from being so limiting for such a large amount of time. It does have ice flows though, these are quite interesting. As weird as it may sound, I consider these a more interesting version of the plankless lanes in Pirate Seas, as certain lanes and areas become more or less dangerous due to them. It makes zombies less lane based and have effects that can transcend lanes, and I think that can be fairly interesting. And people who like this world cite this as the main reason. And for a good reason, I do quite like this gimmick. They add a lot to strategy, and make plans like Split Pea or Bong Choi fairly interesting, as they can be put in unique locations against general foes. It adds a lot to some plants that aren't going to be used much, and also causes some plants like Cherry to be interesting to time, and the plants unlocked in the world generally play well with these. Chart Guard is an AoE wall that can sometimes send zombies to a different path. Stunion works well with clumped enemies, and Rotterberger can use Ice Flows to get three spots to high down chip. The issue is more for zombies, that have a habit of playing into one or the other gimmick, but not both. Let me go through them and explain what I mean. Hunter Zombie can use sliders to freeze plants in annoying locations, and can freeze mobile plants with them instead of just the frontmost one. However, because of Frostwind, they are unlikely to be a huge issue when people already kind of frost super hard on every plant already. Dodo Zombies ignore slider tiles, and thus makes them less of an end all, but doesn't really care if plants get frozen or disabled, as it's not strong enough or fast enough to rush through. Troglobite can use frozen plants to damage plants in the back, and force a ton of dangerous scenarios on the plants, 
but get entirely stopped by slider tiles with nothing they can do about them, disabling them outright. Weasel Hoarders do like plans being frozen as they're fast enough to rush through, but entirely ignore slider tiles so players can't use them for much, making them little more than set dressing when it starts to appear. In this way, these zombies work with one or the other, and not both. Even the plants have an issue though. Stunning is an instance of Frost doesn't affect it, but Char and Rodo both are. Rodo especially doesn't love Frost, as it likes being placed in weird locations that can't fit a lot of good plants, though it does hold against Frost better than most plants. Both Hot Potato and Purple are basically entirely useless outside of Frost, and are so tied with it that neither are usable outside the world. Overall, Frost by Caves is the worst world to me. The zombies aren't too interesting and don't work well for the world overall. The main mechanic sucks, and half the plants are unusable outside of Frost by Caves. Let alone the fact the music can be incredibly degrading. I just don't like this world in the slightest. Now, let's move on to the second worst. One that if you know me, you're well aware of my opinion on. Introducing Dark Ages. Dark Ages is in the self-explanatory Dark Ages. Our time of dumb people. I am not a history person, so I don't know how true this is, but I shall pretend it is because that's pretty much everything this world has. To cover why this world is so low, let's start simply. The Special Zombies. This world has three special zombies, these being the only three zombies that have any form of actual ability. Jester is one of the most annoying zombies in the entire game, neutralising most strategies a player can use, with the exception of strats and aren't reliant on projectiles. It's arguably one of the worst specials in the game for this reason, being incredibly annoying to fight. Wizard is less annoying and is a special I do quite like in comparison. King is very specific, but not utterly awful. It turns Dark Age basic super tanky, but doesn't do much to force zombie progress. It's very passive, and while it can be annoying, the player always has Magnet Room, which is a total hard counter. And that is it! That's all the zombies in the world that do anything. Brilliant. J just brilliant. A world can live or die by having interesting zombies, and this world has one special zombie that is truly great. And it doesn't even work with the world gimmicks, just... Ugh. Dark Ages has three main gimmicks. Firstly, it's a nighttime itself. This slows down a player and often needs to be specifically accounted for. In mods, this is especially bad. Often having Sunstream and Pathstream be basically mandatory for the night levels, and sometimes even being only available during them. In vanilla, this is just somewhat annoying, and that's about all it really does. It makes the early game harder in a world where all the threats are mid to late game. Go figure. This mechanic is generally played on well by the plants, however. All the plants in Dark Ages are pretty helpful when sun is scarce, and so do great at nighttime. Anyways, the next gimmick are graves which take a space and require specific playing around to deal with. These are from Ancient Egypt but are expanded upon here, appearing in the middle of the level and have two new variants which both do benefit the player, providing extra sun and plant food. The Sun Graves kind of overrides the slower early game, which, while I guess appreciated, seems a bit counterintuitive to me. But I guess it's temporary, so it's really not all that extreme. These Graves, however, are not played on well like the plants. Puffs do not like Graves existing, as they block its shots too hard, so only Fume, one out of five plants, can do anything to Graves, and even then is not exactly the best counter to them. As the main threat of a world, it ensures that the player often doesn't have the options they'd really like when playing, which I consider a strict issue. You also have Necromancy, the best ambush in the game. It is very unique and allows the player to have some counter to zombies spawning on top of them, while still being a major issue. It makes Graves more interesting too, and I do quite like the ambush. Unfortunately, this world literally has no special zombies that want to be necromancied, and it is not good as a result. Like, this world would be interesting if a game had a zombie like Explorer to really benefit from being in the front line, but no. How fun. Seriously, I can't emphasize enough how bad the lack of special zombies is for the world. Like, legitimately. Search up Dark Ages Zombies on Google, go into images, and one of the zombies there is straight up a fan-made zombie for a mod. That's how irrelevant these guys are. It's just horrendous. Utterly. It just ruins the world too much, and it is frustrating as a result. Oh, and the music also annoys me. 
It's very screechy to my ears, and a few tracks in particular over rely on the instrument that is either a kazoo or sounds like a kazoo, where it has a habit to get irritating. The only reason it's above Frost by Caves is that the world is redeemable and can be fixed. Zombies like Reanimator come to mind, which are zombies that do actually want to be necromancied and do a variety, but that's not something I can rely entirely on. I guess you can say this proves me that the world isn't fundamentally utterly awful, and so I put it a bit higher. These worlds are actually all equal to me. In fact, so is the next one. A world I also despise, but is higher because, frankly, this is due to non-vanilla experiences, and it's the least bad for it. With that said, let's cover the last truly bad world in my eyes, Jurassic Marsh. Jurassic Marsh is in the time period of dinosaurs. Don't worry, the game also points out a zombie shouldn't exist at this point. They know too, they are in on the joke. Which is good, as this world is also a joke. See, Jurassic Marsh is unique here. Unlike Dark Ages or Frost by Caves, it doesn't really have an issue with its elements not being self synergetic. They very clearly are. The issue, however, is that in reality it only has one trick. It just does that trick four to five different times. It's a world that tends to sell into playing the same way each time for this reason, and it is fairly annoying for that reason. Jurassic Marsh wants to move slow, tanky zombies to the front line. It has a lot of zombies which have the very unique ability of being tanky, and those zombies even have higher HP than usual. It then has a world gimmick, dinos, which basically all moves zombies to the front line. Like, four to five of the dinosaurs literally just do this. The only dinosaur that doesn't do this is Pterodactyl, which will make zombies walk backwards from column one. But hey, at least the world has a game plan, right? It has something it can do. So that's kinda nice. Unfortunately, these are all world gimmicks, and the actual specials here are a lot more disappointing. They decide to all play hooky, as there's quite literally not. I'm serious. It is horrendous and ensures the world is super one note. Now, you're probably thinking of either Rock Puncher or Bully. Now, the former is not a part of any actual levels, and only available during expansions, and is relatively rarely seen. A major issue with it is that it is considered a mini garg by many, as in, it's a small gargantua in many ways. This is for a good reason. You can also just disable its tiles if you play well, but it is more difficult than a normal garg when it hits something. Either way, it's rare in mods too, so I don't have too much to say about fighting it beyond this. Bully, however, is incredibly funny. <laughs> I feel the need to talk about how amusing it is that it has a unique ability that countered quite literally one plan for the majority of its life. Don't worry, it now counters Tumbleweed too, a plan that is, of course, very well known and recognised globally. Joking aside, like, I think two people watching this even know what Tumbleweed does. More relevantly, it blocks Planet B Shiva knocking it back, and that is literally all it does. Heck, it even has slightly lower HP than Bucketheads. It's the worst zombie in the game, except maybe Hollowhead. Anyways, this lack of specials basically locks Jurassic Marsh into having one way to do anything, and so Jurassic Marsh ends up playing the exact same basically every time. The dinos just all do the same thing, just in slightly different ways, so there's not a whole lot else that can be done. Like, you can make a few levels with folks on Pterodactyl. Just a few though, as people despise this thing, and you want to make people not totally die. And then the rest are just Raptor and Stego doing the same thing. Or T-Rex, which does absolutely nothing if you have the right plants. Like, the way conditions work is something we'll get into more later, maybe. But T-Rex just dies to Sapphilane and Snoopy, as they entirely remove a speed boost. Then you get the other end of the spectrum. And Kylo is most notably a piece of crap that can push zombies all the way to column 2, and will push plants back if it hits them. It is a very painful dinosaur, but it is designed to kill. There's not much potential for Kylo. People generally agree it needs to be a rare sight, as otherwise it's a frustration maker. The plants are unique bar Perfume Shroom, which I forget exists at this point, while playing well in the world. And the music is good, but the world doesn't really have much else to redeem it. It's only so high because in the vanilla, the world is actually much better and fits the game well. Its mods where levels have to be longer and more unique, that the world's flaws start to become super apparent. Anyways, these three worlds are bottom three. They are significantly worse than the worlds above, which I mostly think are fine and while I do have complaints there, the worlds have enough that they aren't totally nothing. 
So, with that said, let's move on to the next world, Pirate Seas. This world is based on the Golden Age of Piracy. The first one, let's be real, the modern day is probably the true Golden Age of Piracy. But a world based on a bunch of teenagers in their room is probably a bad idea. Probably. Anyways, this is the second world in the game, and it certainly feels like it. It's got the extra bit of spice that makes it not the first world, but it still has nothing to make it truly fantastic or stand out. It's still certainly playable, though, but a world that definitely suffers from a lack of anything particularly interesting. The main gimmick of Pirate Seas of a plank gimmick. Most zombies can't walk in lanes without a plank, so these lanes require less attention in theory. However, all the special zombies bypasses these in some way, so the gimmick can often feel more minor than you'd think. It often feels like it's best to just deal with every lane equally, but the world does really suffer from AoE being far too effective against it, as the only zombie that can deal with AoE in any capacity is Buckethead. That isn't a joke for the record. This is also combined with the world clustering all zombies into a small amount of lanes. It's very easy to put down, say, a laser beam, and deal with basically everything in a few lanes without much danger being present at all. Which is annoying because every single zombie plays into this being a relevant weakness. Not a single special zombie has more than 500 HP, and they all die painfully laser beam, and it's just... like... A lot of them even summon more zombies, like M Cannon, which just add to this. This just makes a lot of these levels not really all too interesting, and Pirate Seas needs some extra zombies to try and mitigate this. It doesn't help that every special can access plankless lanes in some way here either, as these lanes are also kinda hard by AoE. It's a mess overall, that makes normal levels really difficult to make interesting. The world just doesn't have an answer to area effect, and it makes the world not really perform well more often than I'd like. But at the very least the plants are nice, and I say fit the world very well. The music isn't great though, it's a weird mix between ancient Egypt and later worlds, and just sort of exists between. Which is unfortunate, but the music is still fine, so I'm not horribly against it. Ultimately, the world is higher than the worlds below it because it can at least do something interesting, which is a step above. It's a boring world, not a frustrating one. There's also not a whole lot to say about it, really. I mean, it's funny that Barrel Roller exists, I guess. It's a high HP threat that, in theory, should counter Aerial Effect and is meant to be in that role, but Aerial Effect plants will just hit the Barrel and the Pirate at the same time which renders it mute. That's something, I guess. Well, whatever. Let's enter a world that, while not so simple, is not a favourite of mine. Lost City. A world based on the exploration of an old Mayan temple. This is a fairly American thing, the whole Lost City of Gold concept, which seems to somewhat be evoked here, though that is very clear for the world gimmick, which is admittedly, literally called Gold Tiles. These are my biggest issue for world, which I should probably explain. Gold Tiles are a world gimmick that benefits a player. When placed on, they will produce 50 sun. Once initially, but then every 20 seconds afterwards, which is much more rapid than sunflowers at 34 seconds. This is an issue and I don't think I need to fully explain why. They just give way, way too much sun. Like, an absurd amount. This is one of the issues with mechanics that buff a player in general. If they become too strong, things start to fall apart. Lost City is the biggest example of this, as the entire world is entirely focused on these gold tiles, as they are so powerful and completely take over the pace of the game. This makes the world very, very rapid paced. This can be a real issue, though, as it makes the world have a really bad habit of collapsing and becoming raw enemy spam which isn't super interesting. This isn't helped by the zombie selection either. The only remotely heavy threat is Relic Hunter, a high HP threat that can spawn on columns 4 to 6. It's good, but it's the only thing Lost City has, and isn't super effective alone. The rest of threats in this world just aren't really all too heavy, only being as late game as Bugheads are. The zombie selection is also generally fairly poor, unfortunately. This is mostly down to two specific zombies that need to be important for the world to be great, but just aren't good enough. These are Parasol and Importer. Parasol is a nothing special. Its main job is a synergize with Excavator, which isn't a terrible niche form to have, but it doesn't do anything else. It's meant to counter a lot of the things that can counter them, but it doesn't actually do that job well. It's only a counter to Catapult Plants, 
and its only thing close to unique ability is its slightly higher speed. Excavator is a great special because it also counters walls in a unique way, while countering straight shooters. Parasol just doesn't do anything in comparison. Importer is just worthless. It's meant to turn gold tiles into a more neutral force in the world. It doesn't, uh, do that. It is very easy to stop turning into a tent, unless it's not, at which point it will always trigger with little you can actually do. Tents themselves are also sitting ducks for instant plants, and only rarely spawn anything that is dangerous, and at max, it's still just a slow bucket that gets caught in anything. These two specials tend to cause the world to be more or less entirely zombie spam, as nothing else can be done. This is further caused by the world having a really bad habit of spamming the X tier plus parasol combo. This isn't inherently awful, but it just encourages AoE pierces, which neutralize a lot of things in the world that isn't called Relic Hunter. The zombie spam just always plays the same, which is this world's biggest weakness. However, with proper balancing and care, the game can try to avoid this, and if they do, they are in a great position, which is worthwhile. This is the first world I truly believe can semi-reliably create great levels. Now, from the spammiest world in the game to the least, let's get into the most unique world in the game. Ancient Egypt. Do I need to say where and when this place is set? Yes, actually. Ancient Egypt, despite the name, is most focused on the movie, adventurous version of the era. All pyramids, exploration, and fantastical religion. This is a thing of all worlds actually, also based on movie versions and other forms in common media, as opposed to actual periods of time. Anyways, this is also the first world in the game. And that's exactly why it's unique, as its goal is to introduce new players to the game. However, I will say that this world is far from popular, and for good reason. Ancient Egypt doesn't have a whole lot of things. It doesn't have a unique gimmick, as both gimmicks unique to Ancient Egypt are straight up reused later on in other worlds. Grays and Dark Ages, and Sandstorms and Frostbite Caves. This is notable, and a huge upset for a lot of people, as the only things left are basically nothing. This is extended to the plants, all of which are very basic, with the most unique plant you get being Bloomerang. Furthermore, the world in general doesn't have a great track record of excitement, mostly because of music, being very slow paced and more passive than most other tracks in the game. This world is so high because, to me, it doesn't at all fail at what it's trying to do, which is be a tutorial world, and that's about it. It has simple enemies introduced to player to the game and the concept of zombies having additional abilities. This is why this world has zombies like Ra Zombie. Of course, though, this doesn't change the fact that Ra Zombie is, in fact, Ra Zombie. Actually, a lot of specials in this world have functionally no danger, or even a true mechanic. Most notably being Camel Zombie, which has no real mechanic and just spawns a bunch of zombies at once. Ra Zombie is also not a particularly dangerous threat in general, being able to be stopped by just looking at the screen. A mighty challenge, apparently, and one that definitely falls off later on. However, weak specials like this are essential to get the game to be in a state that's actually playable. And as a result, I think Ancient Egypt is well made. The issue is, though, that you cannot just ignore the fact that playing Ancient Egypt can be very, very boring. Its gimmicks are basic and reused elsewhere after all, and the zombies aren't exactly all that good. There are only three zombies that can pose any real threat, Explorer, Tomb Raider, and Pharaoh, and none of them are particularly dangerous. Explorer is easily counted, Tomb Raider isn't immediately threatening, and Pharaoh doesn't have increased eat DPS when broke out of, being a weakened newspaper for that reason. Though, I will admit that these specials work well with both Greys and Sandstorms. Greys protect Tomb Raider and Explorer, Pharaoh protects them both as well, with Tomb Raiders providing additional field control, as both Explorer and Pharaoh both like being Sandstormed to the front. This makes this world unironically a step above a lot of the other worlds in this game, which is both amusing and upsetting in similar parts. Either way, Ancient Egypt is as high solely because it does exactly what apes do, and does it well as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't have any significant real flaw that breaks the whole world, just being a bit on the boring side, which is a big upside and a relative rarity. This is also the last world in this tier, which are all overall worlds I can enjoy, but aren't particularly great. Going onward, we can clear up the rest of the worlds remaining. 
these ones are the worlds that I think are particularly great, and I think are the beginnings of the best, and why I enjoy this game. So, with that said, let's move on to the next world, Neon Mixtape 2. Unlike other worlds, this world is based on the 1980s nightclub culture, and gamer culture too, apparently. Either way, this is a time period PubCap has always liked for some bizarre reason, and are super nostalgic for. I mean, look at Battle for Neighborville or Disco Zombie. Canonically, Dave remembers this time period though, which is probably the most unique thing that the time travel concept really amounted to. Though, let's be real, there's like, two people that care about PZ2 lore. Anyways, this world is an absolute fan favourite, and for good reason. It has, by far, the best aesthetic of any world. It has a whole cast of unique zombies filled with strong personality in their movements. It is a very unique world out of all worlds available, and as a standout world, it tends to be a fan favourite, and I do have to agree. The world's central mechanic are jams. These are powerful mechanics that heavily buff all zombies on screen, or nerf them. This is partially done through speed changes. Out of the five jams, Punk and Metal will speed up all zombies by 50% and 25% while Pop will cause all zombies to be slowed down by 20% or so. Alongside these, though, the zombies have a new mechanic. Depending on the jam, they may activate and have an ability, or not activate and have no ability if the jam matches them. Punk zombies are fast and ignore plants in their way, kicking them back during Punk Jam. Little zombies activate during Pop, and will make all zombies behind them immune to all damage. MCs and Breakdancers both activate during Rap. The former killing all plants in every nursery radius, and the latter gaining both a speed boost and the ability to push zombies forward. Arcade zombies push huge arcade machines, which activate during 8-bit to allow zombies to spawn for them. The Gargoyles in this world can hit the ground during metal, spawning devastating projectiles as they do. The only zombie that isn't affected by the jam will be Boombox, who will disable all plants on the lawn for a short while if he gets close enough. These zombies are unique, but I do have a few issues with this world mostly because of Glitter and Metal Garg, but also the way the speed boosts work. Glitter just isn't strong enough to make Pop Jam not a massive weakness of the world. It doesn't have a whole lot of HP, and while its effect isn't insignificant, the Jam can't do anything alone, and has a bad habit of making the Bucketheads from previous waves easy to deal with. The main friend in this world is often Punk Bucketheads, after all. However, Hair Metal Gargantua is absurdly overpowered and a nightmare to fight. In pretty much every mod I have ever seen, this zombie receives the most nurse of any, simply because he is busted beyond belief. It's infamous, for sure. Oh, and the way conditions work makes Punk kinda questionable and stick to counter at times. Zombies usually speed up using an internal mechanic called conditions, but the way they work, they are incapable of stacking. So, when you use Dahlia during Punk, it ends up slowing the zombies down based on their original movement speed. It doesn't just halve the zombie speed, it overrides the speed, and then halves it. This basically makes every star much, much stronger for the world, which they didn't really need and can make the world trivial if used well. The world also has a bad habit of being overly reliant on the jams. I would have appreciated the world having at least one more out of jam threat, but the world is still fine as is. Oh, and the plants are like the worst in the game, just generally. Despite everything, I still do like this world though, Neon Mixtape 2 is a world where I have a lot of bad things to say. That's not to say it can't work. I think Neon Mixtape 2 has the most fantastic presentation of any world in the game. Just listen to the damn music. But I also think it does the most things wrong of these top worlds. But it can still make good levels, so what is there to really complain about? Anyways, uh, next world. Big Wave Beach. <laughs> Big Wave Beach is broadly similar to Nina Thape Tua in terms of setting. It exists during a very American era, where tiki culture was starting to explode in popularity. It's probably the oddest world in the game for me for this reason, but eh. I guess I wanted a water world, and this was better than the alternatives. Meh. Either way, Big Wave Beach being this high might seem a little odd to you, but honestly, I can't get enough of this place. It's just good fun, really. It's hard, yes and has some really off levels in vanilla. Just keep in mind that I'm ignoring those levels here, and modded Big Wave Beach is great when its difficulty isn't curb-stomped into one side of scale. Usually. 
Anyways, if you ignore the terrible level design, this world is very fun. Big Wave Beach is an insanely kinetic world. There are tons of waves of zombies and stars swarming up front, with a huge amount of threats that the player has to look out for. Like, listen. Every other world in PZ2 has that one zombie which doesn't offer much. Neomissive Tour has Glitter, Far Future has Jetpack, Pirate Seas has Seagull. Big Wave's beach version of a zombie is Snorkel, and Snorkel is an actual problem and straight up my favourite zombie in the game. Big Wave Beach is a world that wants to rush you down. It wants to crumple you under the initial sprint of everything running at you all at once. And this is a genuinely great gameplay style, and one that can be very fun. Tide is probably the most important gimmick in the entire game, as it defines the world and gameplay around it. Big Wave Beach requires the tide to slow down a player's expansion early on, as it slows down a player a lot, requiring lily pads to be placed, and making the zombies more threatening because the tide makes things just that much harder to work with. It's great. Now this world does have some severe flaws, most notably being the, as I like to call it, BS Factor. This world can sometimes just throw utter garbage at you. Fisher, most notably. Fisherman is just far too strong compared to most specials in the game, requiring a player to severely counter him, which I don't think is all that fun or interesting. Surfer is also sometimes jank in an annoying way, because it's Surfer, I won't go into this again, but is less bad for this overall. It also lacks specials. It only has four, and while these are four major threats, and is ignoring low tide as a danger, it means it is a little more limited than I'd like. The issue is just nowhere near sincere, as unlike a world like Dark Ages, it doesn't drag it down by much, but is still noticeable. It is also relatively weak in terms of visuals. I don't love a lot of visual elements about this world, to put it lightly. It feels not super tied to the time period, and it really does seem like it could just take place in the modern day, and it wouldn't change much. It doesn't use a time travel theme well, basically, and is fairly boring for that reason. Like, the world's name is just Big Wave Beach. It's a beach with big waves. Like, come on. <laughs> in general, though, I do think Big Wave Beach is one of the best worlds, which goes hard on a gameplay concept and really does succeed. It makes this world super unique to play, and has a strong identity, which is something I really do appreciate in a good world. Anyways, now we should move on to the next world. Probably the least deserving world of this entire tier list, but no, whatever. Let's move on to the next world. Far Future. Far Future is set some time in the vague future. We'll look back in this world in how many years and laugh at how comedically inaccurate it is. Believe it. Beyond that, uh, this world really shouldn't be up here. It's not all that great. It's extremely flawed, and its strengths don't make up this at all. However, Far Future is simultaneously a world that really suffers from things I despise in a world, but also very specifically appeals to me. Let me explain. Far Future is a very unique world. It's like Lost City where it has a mechanic that benefits the player, in power tiles. These don't overwhelm the world as much, and the world's biggest gimmick is that the enemies are all super heavy in late game, or at least the ones you remember. Discatron, Volomech, and so on are all heavy threats that impact the late game a whole lot, being some of the strongest enemies in the entire game to compensate for the world having a beneficial gimmick. It is also important to note that it seems implied that Gargantua Prime was originally going to be the only Gargantua, with the other worlds not actually having one until later updates. So yes, this world would have had THE most dangerous late game zombie in the entire game. The more you know. Anyways, with that said, the world does have a few issues still. Most notably, there are some super dangerous threats, but the world still kinda suffers from being a bit too... One note. Blame me, Impeach. This might be the worst world plan for what it does to the world. It totally knocks down every single threat in Far Future, and makes them so much more... manageable. It is a 40% uptime stun in a 5x5 area. I just hate this thing a lot. This just wasn't necessary, as power tiles are already insanely powerful, which I find frustrating. It makes the world a bit too easy in most cases, 
ensuring that most heavy threats can be shut down reliably, incredibly rapidly. However, Far Future is a world that is focused on a heavy late game, and I do enjoy this a lot. I love good, long levels, and that is something Far Future offers in spades. It is specifically made to make long levels play well, with a good variety of heavy late game threats, which is absolutely my favourite kinds of levels. The one issue is a lack of immediate threats. None of the Far Future specials are particularly threatening immediately, and can't do a whole lot without the enemies having to get close, first. They are just too slow and lack of speed, so they tend to slow down too much and lack any full momentum against the player to break through. However, I still love this world, and the majority of it is the futuristic theme. Like, it's my favourite setting of a personal level, and I love the mechanical designs of the zombies here too. They're all very unique and filled with unique details. But Gantra Prime is also one of the most extreme enemies in the entire game, and it's probably a favourite of mine for that reason alone. It's good. I'm just too much of a sucker for what the world does, and it strikes me personally, but not on a level to overcome the best worlds in the game. There are a few worlds left, and if you've been following, the remaining two is about to appear, but, I mean, if you figured that out, you know what the order is. It's not that much longer now, and both these worlds are at a tier above the rest. Let's introduce the final world. This is my single most favourite world in the game, and it's an important one. Introducing... Wild West. Wild West is based on American stuff. Probably around the gold rush considering the town it is in seems very conventional for the time period, and zombies like Prospector exist which clearly lend themselves to it. Anyways, Wild West is the perfect world. It doesn't have any real flaws from my way of thinking, it does everything so right. Now. This is all down to personal preference, evidently. Wild West is a world that isn't exactly the most popular, but I stand by that there isn't a better world. It just does everything right. And that will stop the gimmick. Minecarts. Minecarts have two elements, rails and carts. Rails are implantable tiles. Carts are plantable on and can navigate rails by dragging them up and down across them. Bibs gimmick is what every gimmick should be. It's interesting. It combines a weakness with a strength, and that is pretty interesting and just straight up good game design. You lose space, but you gain a more valuable tile in exchange. Using minecarts well requires the player to constantly be active. They aren't really crucial all the time, but they are very helpful if a player can use them well. They also remove a lot of space from the field, most notably making stabilizing a defense nigh impossible. This is great and helps maintain a general level of threat, without being too overwhelming as a consequence. It makes the early game more dynamic, while making the late game more dynamic. It's great. And the specials here are some of the best in the game, and it's not even close. The only special in this world that isn't fantastic is Poncho, who is generally considered fairly lame. However, it has Chicken Wrangler, Prospector, Ball and Piano. A set of threats more or less perfectly catered to make the world functionally interesting. Chicken Wranglers use a limited space to maximise their threat. Prospectors attack from behind, requiring space to be taken up without precautions against them, or to risk your option to instead go all in. Bull Zombies are fast moving heavy threats, which fling imps in far and require the player to rapidly react to their movement. A fantastic and interesting threat whenever they appear, and one I do respect immensely. Piano is just a genius mechanic in general. It makes the basics of the world shift things rapidly, which is great when you consider the main mechanic of the world are plants that can shift lanes rapidly. It's brilliantly done. Overall, the levels in this world tend to require the player to plan ahead around the limited space, and focus mid-game to ensure that minecarts are in the right place at the right time. It diverts focus from the rest of the field, and I adore it. The music and visuals are strong too. The Wild West music is iconic for a good reason, and it is very unique and fitting. I actually love how the Wildest music in general feels like it has a slight tone of time breaking apart, or at least that is how it sounds to me. It fits in with the game's general theme to me, and it's something I really appreciate in the world, because a lot of worlds it feels like the time travel element is barely used. It's a nice change of pace that I like a lot. Anyways, there is one world that makes the most out of a time travel theming, more so by default, but hey, it's important. 
It's also a world I actually don't love, but is a top more so out of default. With that said, give a less than warm welcome to the true final world. Mon day. Mon day is upsetting and poorly done. It is arguably the worst world in the game, and is top like this simply because of the nature of a tier list. Remember, I am not considering vanilla levels in this tier list. Monday has some of the worst design of any world in the game, and that's a simple fact I feel. Some of the later levels in this world especially are incredibly poorly made, and the world gimmick entirely disappears after level 21 of 34. It's horrible. However, this world is also the best by default, because it has everything. Minecart, sliders, dinosaurs, grades, portals, basically every relevant world gimmick in the entire game can be used here, and it makes this world more dynamic and open to level making opportunities. This is even more extreme due to the way the world works, allowing any zombie from any world to be used. This makes the best world more or less by default. Like, a lot of mods will use foreign zombies in their world, and there is a good reason for that. They allow variety and can create more interesting levels by default. Minecars plus Crystal Skull, for a random example that comes to mind. It's an inherent nature of this world, and so it sort of feels like the best world by default. However, there is an argument to be made that it should be ranked with the idea that it can only use its own stuff. Hmm. Everything this world adds is basically nothing. Eh, uh, sure. This world is secretly the bottom of the list for being utterly embarrassing. Four special zombies, one of which being entirely useless unless all star, an overbuff newspaper, a zombie that instantly kills a plant which can be annoying to stop, and a worthless balloon. World is terrible, thank god. Uh, anyways, I think I'm done. Worlds are basically the main thing PZ2 brings to the table, and it's the main thing that pawns the game offers to the player. They define progression, and I feel that they are what creates variety and intrigue, but also just charm in general. If you think of PZ2, you're thinking of these worlds every time. But even bad worlds here have something to do. I'm not going to claim these worlds down here are always awful, or that these worlds up here are always good and can do no wrong. Firstly, I am extremely opinionated, but also every world can do something and can be fixed up. Mods do this all the time and the exact tiers will always change because of this. Always remember, just because something is low, doesn't make it worthless. Either way, I have to get going. I need to make myself food as I am very hungry. This has been Creeps, and have a good one.